Battalion of President Heading, maintain 3,500 till established on the localizer. Third, the ILS 32 approach. When you have an applicant come in and they have low time, like let's call it, I don't know, let's say someone came in with like 58 hours or something. Do you treat them any differently? Is that somebody you're going to scrutinize more? Well, um, I try not to be prejudiced against any applicant uh, for any reason. That's what we're uh, trained to do. And, and that's the kind of personality that the FAA selects for, for people who are examiners. We're supposed to be good judge, judge good judge of character and good judge of experience. Um, so the things that are red flags to me potentially uh, are uh, very low scores on the knowledge test. And there's actually a requirement for every area where you've missed questions. I have to delve into, you know, really deep detail on all those things and make sure that the endorsement that your instructor gave you that said that you've received the additional training and you demonstrate adequate knowledge, I need to make sure that that's occurred. Now, if somebody comes in with really low time, uh, it depends. I'll usually ask the applicant uh, what their background is. Now, many years ago as a recommending instructor, I had a student, a uh, private student, and he went for his check ride with 44 hours total. Wow. And I called the examiner that I was using and I said, look, uh, you're going to see this guy has really low time and I wouldn't send him to you if he wasn't ready. And I want to tell you a little bit about his background. His dad owned a plane and he grew up flying either in the back seat or in the right seat with his dad and his uncle for years. So when he started flight training, he was already accustomed to the experience of flight and he just started learning right away. Plus there were things he learned uh, observing his dad and his uncle. Some of them were not good habits, by the way. <laughs> but, <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> uh, but, so that gave him a leg up. Um, so, you know, I'll usually ask, it's not necessarily a deal breaker, but just remember that um, it might give me a little bit of concern, but if I see that the performance is there and they meet the standards, that's really what it means at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, you mentioned something there that led to a question for me is <clears throat> you said you called the examiner ahead of time. And sometimes I do that too, to just ask about <clears throat> things that might be gray areas or to alert them of anything you just said. Is that something that bugs you at this point? Or do you, do you mind if the CFI calls you and has a normal conversation first? No, no not at all. I, I think it's always better to try to head off any problems in advance because nobody likes it when an applicant shows up for the check ride. And because of some sort of problem that the examiner wasn't alerted to or that the examiner couldn't give feedback on like mm -hmm. two weeks in advance, it can't be fixed that day and now we can't start the test. Right. right. And, and given the number of um, people who are looking for tests, you know, a lot, it's a lost opportunity. And then I can't fill that slot. Um, so lost income for me, uh, lost testing opportunity for the applicant. So yeah, I think, you know, communication is key. And uh, I have no problem with people trying to communicate. If you call me at 10 o'clock at night, I'm probably not going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just the standard, you know, in any phone call, I would guess. Um, the other thing that I was going to ask you is, you know, <clears throat> I got into a conversation with Steve Thorne yesterday from Flight Chops, and I was, we, I was just saying that after so many years of teaching, sometimes I feel, as, as crazy as this sounds, I feel like if you put a pilot in the left seat next to me, and I watch that pilot start the engine, taxi out, do the run-up, take off, leave the ground fly a normal upwind into a regular pattern around to a safe approach, I feel like I can judge that pilot's ability a lot more than I would have thought possible when I started. So my question for you is, after being an, an examiner for a certain period of time, are there any things you notice when somebody walks in where you like, you see three things and you're like, oh man, this is going to be one of those, like this is going to be a, a fail or this is going to be a tough ride. Are there any telltales like that? Um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I try not to have any preconceived notions. Now, sometimes I'll get a sense that the communication style between me and the applicant is different and that it's going to be, uh, it's going to require more effort for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's always uh, unfortunate when an applicant shows up and their paperwork and their logbooks aren't in order. Yeah. It's a problem with their endorsements. But, you know, that's, just, that's part of my job. So um, 
it's not uncommon for paperwork, if everything is done correctly, the paperwork at the beginning of a, of a test to take a half an hour. Yeah. Uh, I've had it take an hour and a half. Uh, yeah. Where uh, there was a maintenance entry that wasn't done correctly and they have to chase down a mechanic and they're going to get a new entry and email it. I'm going to print it out. We're going to set it in with the log books. Uh, a classic thing is people show up and their logbook pages are not totaled. Um, now, you can use paper logbook, you can use an electronic logbook, whatever you want to use, but I have to, examiners are required to review the training record and to certify that I reviewed the training record. Right. So if I can't make sense of, you know, what, what's in your logbook, you know, things are crossed out and scribbled and whatever. So um, I think logbooks are a huge thing. Um, but in terms of uh, uh, an applicant having, you know, telltale signs, I, I think it, it takes you know, a long period of time to figure out what's going on. Because sometimes people are nervous. Right. Usually they're nervous. And I always give people a chance to succeed. If they give me a weird answer or an incorrect answer, and I'm not sure they understood the question, I'll circle back around. And if I get consistent incorrect answers, now I've got some knowledge that something's not right here. There's a gap in this person's training. Same thing in the flight portion. If I see some you know, weird behavior that maybe isn't exactly against the standards, but it kind of makes my spidey senses tingle. I usually look for a pattern. And in most cases, if there's a gap in the training, that pattern will recur, whether it's aeronautical decision making, how they're configuring the plane. Um, so I don't, I don't like that situation where there's one thing you do and it's boom, you know, game over. Look up in the sky. Look up in the sky, and there you are Floating like an angel on the airwaves Or falling like a raven in the afternoon